Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here today presenting a virtual doc talk. My name is Whitney Negebauer, and I am the director of Whale Scout. Right now, I am home in Bothell, Washington, on the indigenous lands of the Coast Salish peoples, who have reserved treaty rights to this land, including the Snoqualmie, Snohomish, Tulalip, and Stillaguamish tribes. I grew up basically in the same place I'm sitting now, born with a fierce love of the whales with unknown origins. My first memories of the whales were from books, reading with my dad before bed and later, under, undersea explorations with Jacques Cousteau. I can remember distinctly the very first whale I ever saw was J1 Ruffles. Coming up right under the bow of the boat right in front of me, I saw his tall wavy fin rise right out of the water and then grow taller and taller right in front of me. In that instant, I already knew who he was. Every whale is named and their stories are written each year as the whales return and are followed. Within moments, whales were popping up all around us their powerful breath surrounding our senses and connecting, connecting their watery world with our own. It felt like their family pod blended together with my own as we traveled across the water together. Ruffles was an older male who traveled with J2, also known as Granny. She would capture our hearts as the oldest orca in the world. Each whale's dorsal fin and saddle patch is like a unique fingerprint or face, helping researchers track them over time. In the 1970s, when Ken Balcom began studying southern resident killer whales in Washington state, he already had a leg up on the research, following the pioneering work of Dr. Michael Big, who studied northern resident killer whales. Together over time, after careful observation of the whales, watching from a distance and learning, the whales told their own stories. When a calf was born into a pod, they remained with the same family group their entire life. From there, the family histories were constructed. Each whale was given a scientific name like J2 and a nickname like Granny. Giving the whales names was done on purpose, originally meant to connect people in the hopes of protecting the whales from aquarium capture operations. By giving the whales names and telling their stories as mothers and daughters and sons, early orca conservationists changed public perception and won huge victories for the pods. Early researchers frequently found bullet wounds on the whales' backs thought to have been from fishermen competing for salmon. My first experience with, J, with J-Pod was in, the 90, was in the 1990s, when the southern resident population of orcas was at a recent peak of nearly 100 whales between all three pods, J, K, and L. By the time I was in high school, these same whales, including Ruffles and Granny, were in serious trouble. My grandpa mailed me a newspaper clipping, and the articles read, Fireproof orcas in outlining the research of the whale's toxicant loads, which included flame retardants, among others. The whales were now endangered. Lack of salmon was identified as the primary cause, along with underwater noise. Although I crossed the country to Florida for school, I felt called back to the Salish Sea to play a part in the destiny of these whales. I couldn't sit idly by and watch these whales any longer. The experience and joy and the awe that Ruffles and Granny brought to me needed to be repaid. I returned home and set out to address the most immediate threat of the orcas, their food. This was not simple at all, and frankly, I knew very little about salmon. But the fate of the whales is inextricably linked to salmon, so I pressed on, exploring my own local watershed. When a mentor took me to a nearby stream, literally behind a Subway sandwich shop in October to see spawning salmon, it was game on. I was totally hooked, asking question after question. How did the fish find a mate anyways? What happens to their carcass in the stream? Standing witness to this incredible act of nature prompted my own questioning and exploration. I saw in person the fish struggle past man-made obstacles in the stream and seek refuge under trees and logs for rest and protection. The whales I love deeply depend upon these leaves, riffles, and insects to, to sustain the salmon. Seeing the orca's future survival right beneath my own two feet, I began working as hard as I could, leading others to understand the connections between orcas and the health of urban watersheds right down to the foundational levels of an ecosystem, native plants, clean water, and healthy soils and beaches. I literally had to see it and feel it to understand it, and I knew that others would too. 
asking people to go out in the rain and plant trees in the cold would require a good deal of motivation, and the whales provided that. Myself and a team of volunteers first began working to show longtime residents in the Seattle and Tacoma area the whales from shore, which felt like the most accessible and drew the tightest connections to place. When people learn that the milk calves drink from their own mothers is often extremely toxic and that lack of salmon exacerbates that situation, the obvious question comes next, what can we do? At Whale Scout, the answer is simple. Restore the habitats and the ecosystems salmon rely upon. Just get your hands dirty. Just dive in and fix it. Together with our partners, we've connected whale watchers with projects throughout Puget Sound. We've planted trees along Chinook salmon migratory corridors, such as the Sammamish River, spawning streams like North Creek, and helped reforest areas formerly clear-cut on marine hillsides at the Maury Island Marine Park, bringing back some of the natural erosional processes that feed the beach with the right types of sediment at the right speed to make the all-important forage fish habitat. The work we do saving whales shares the same goals as the amazing work at Sound Experience. In our experience with nature, we must listen. Listen and observe the animals' stories. Listen to the story the data tells us from scientists. Bring our children outside to the natural world so that every day can be filled with joy, awe, and inquiry. Let nature tell its story from its majestic creatures to the foundations of our ecosystems all the way up. Being immersed in nature is where we make our deepest connections, are open to true perspectives, and can reach the greatest understanding of the ways the natural world works. Thank you so much to Monica Whelan-Shields and Hannah Letinich for these photos. And thank all of you for listening today.